Good afternoon. It is 4.52, Wednesday, October 23rd. This is the TDN Writer's Room Podcast. I'm Joe Bianca, Associate Editor at the Thoroughbred Daily News. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Daily News and still on cloud nine after the Yankees lost to the Astros. This guy's Red Sox shirt on and everything. (laughs) Jonathan Green from uh, DJ Stable, general manager. And I'm on cloud 10, as it were, uh, because we're going to have a horse running in one of the Breeders' Cup races. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, This is Alan Carrasso, managing editor of the TDN. So I guess we'll start with that. We're going to we're going to go through the Breeders' Cup pre-entries here. They just came out about an hour or so ago or a couple hours ago. So it's going to it's going to be a little maybe a little sloppy here as we're still kind of formulating opinions, but we'll start with Friday's races. Future Stars Friday or am I making that up? Is That's that something it, yeah. else? Future yeah. Stars. Okay. So yeah. we're doing Future Stars Friday. We're going to start with the Juvenile Turf Sprint and kicks off the festivities and we have an interested party here. Uh John Green and his father Len have another miracle. American Pharaoh Colt coming off a fifth place run in the Futurity. Before that, won the Skidmore Stake, drew into the main body of the field. So congratulations on that. How are you feeling about it? Thank you. No, it's a, it's quite an honor. Uh, anytime you can have a horse go from being one of 20,000 foals born a year to you know 14,000, I think the number is, of, of horses that actually race to 7,000 winners, all the way down, down, down to a field of 12, um, and having a chance to uh, get the brass ring in one of 12, that's, uh, you know, that, that's pretty heady stuff. So we're excited. You know, I don't want to sound cliche, but we're excited just to be there. Um, but we certainly look like, uh, based on the numbers, that we have a puncher's chance in the race. What did you, what did you think about his run in the futurity? Uh, you know, basically, you can draw a line through that race uh, for two reasons. One is it was a really, you know, s- kind of yielding course, which he is not a fan of, um, so much so that he actually ripped off uh, his front shoe hmm. in the middle of the race and uh, and still kind of staggered home and, and only lost by a couple of lengths. Um, the fact that it's going to be a firmer turf, the fact that it's going to be a five furlongs uh, race versus a six furlong race, I think just plays right to his strengths. Okay. I think one of the stories of this race really is, is Wesley Ward. Um, he's got a couple entered. He's got the undefeated Cambria, um, Stone Street Philly, who's three for three, won the Kentucky Downs juvenile turf sprint against boys. He's got the horse, uh, I think, is one of the more interesting horses to run on Friday is Kamari, uh, Tembrook Farm. Really put it together, and I thought, an unbelievable run to win the Indian Summer last out, also against the boys. Before that, won the Bolton Landing by four lengths and was second of 25 horses in the Queen Mary on June 19th at Ascot and seems to have been working well recently. I think he's got a good shot. I think she's got a good shot for Wesley Ward. you got also got a couple of Aiden O'Brien Euros in there. I think the Juvenile Turf Sprint has been useful in that regard to add a little more Euro flavor um, I think even more so than the other juvenile turf races. Any early impressions well, about these 20, races? Twenty twenty-six in the, twenty-six entered. You got one more so than the Queen room Mary. For, room for twelve. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe they'll stage this at, at an Ascot or something. But hey, John, I want to ask you a question. Sure. Like, um, like five A's on that on that turf course in a field of twelve. That's got to give you some cause to pause. Well, I, I think what it really comes down to is, uh, you know, in a race like that, any five eighths race, I'm not saying anything that, that, that nobody knows about, but you have to be able to break and you have to show at least early uh, speed just if for no other reason, just to keep your position. Um, you know, I would be worried if we're going to be 10, 11, 12 post in that race. Um, I think anything else other than that, and, and you have a pretty good shot. Um, it, you know, surprisingly, uh, there are so many horses nominated for this race and preempted into this race. Um, and, you know, you can make a case for a lot of them. I know, again, we're just getting the information as, as it's coming out. But um, so many of the European horses in the past have, have come over and, and you would think, OK, they're running against so many other horses and, and uh, therefore they're seasoned. But the, the graded races there are are not really great at stake races mm-hmm. in, in comparison to what we run here. Um, so, you know, you, you don't want to be seduced into thinking, oh, my God, this horse is a grade one winner or a grade two winner already, and it's going to come and blow your doors off. Not necessarily. Um, however, you know, to your point, they're running against, you know, two dozen horses. Um, thankfully, it's not a relay race. You know, they, they all have to run straight and and and, uh, and then make a turn. But um, I think we have a pretty good shot at it. And, uh, you know, Manny Franco is actually coming out to California to ride him, which, which gives us a little more confidence as right. well. Yeah, and I think in the five for a long race, I think it's it's really kind of high variance. It's all about trip, and it's just it's it's a hard race to handicap every year for sure. 
Uh, and remember, and this is going to be a topic throughout um, many of these races, um, this would have been six and a half furlongs down the hill, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is such a different race, both this and the, and the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint uh, are such different races at five furlongs than six and a half. I mean, they're totally different animals. So, um, you know, that's we're going to get the first glimpse of a, of a, a distance. Uh, that really didn't exist at Santa Anita until, um, you know, this year. Every, every turf sprint, I don't believe they ever, ever ran these five furlong uh, sprints on the turf, and they also now have five and a half furlongs. But um, before that, so, uh, you know, goodbye to the six and a half furlongs down the hill, which, by the way, I don't want to get off topic too much. I hope they bring that back. I mean, it, it, I don't see any reason why that would be any more dangerous than anything else. And, uh, you know, maybe they're just trying to appease some people. But I I, I hope that, uh, you know, we see the down the hill races back someday. Yep. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a unique unique uh, experience to Santa Anita. Um, ben Massam, when he was at the Breeders' Cup, our co-worker, the TDN, did a good story uh, about with like local California trainers about what it took to win down the hill. And I think it was, it was definitely an interesting wrinkle to throw into the championships. I'm uh, going to move on just to, to the juvenile turf real quick. I don't know if there's, there's a ton to say there. Arizona, I feel like, seems like the horse to beat for Coolmar. was second in the Dewhurst Stakes at Newmarket last time out. Nobody in the the... American contingent really jumps off the page to me. I thought Decorated Invader ran pretty well to win the summer. That was a pretty slow pace. So I think he's got a reasonable chance. So, yeah, not much to say about the, the juvenile turf. I would say we can move on to the juvenile Phillies where, unlike the ju unlike the juvenile, where I think there are some clear standouts. I mean, obviously you have Bast, who's a two-time grade one winner. But I think there's a distinct possibility that a maiden winner, last out, first out maiden winner, could be the favorite in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. I'm talking about Kaleem Shah's Donna Veloce, who has the highest buyer in the field, won by nine and a quarter lengths, first time out, September 28th at Santa Anita, come back and breezed a best of 44, five furlongs in Arcadia. So I think there's a decent chance that she'll be favored. Maybe not. Maybe the steam of the Bob Baffert Bast is, is too much, but I think this race is distinctly more wide open feeling than the juvenile. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And Donna Veloce is certainly very interesting. And uh, But, you know, that, let's not forget, um, you know, you've got to be a very special horse to go from a six furlong maiden win to win the Breeders' Cup race, the juvenile fillies. So, I mean, she's going to have to be really exceptional. And uh, it's a classic handicapping um conundrum that, uh, you know, do you go for the fastest horse, which is her, or do you go for the proven horse, which is Bast, who is a two-time grade one winner, has already won around two turns. And, um, you know, talk about the odds, she'll obviously be a lot higher than this, but she was one to five last time out when winning the Chandelier. I think when it's all said and done, that you know, the Baffert mojo will make Bast the favorite. But I, I do agree with you that Donna Veloce is going to take a lot of money, but she's not going to be somebody that when I sit down and make my picks, um, I, I just think that's too tall in order for any horse uh, to, to go, uh, you know, throw him into the deep end like this. Um, and if she wins, you know, I'll congratulate him and say, my goodness, what a talented filly. But, um, uh, you know, certainly uh, she would even win the championship, I would imagine, if she were to win this. Uh, right now, Bass is the leader. But um, Donna Veloce is interesting, but not my cup of tea. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, stretching out from six and a half furlongs, that's definitely a, a, a pretty significant stretch out. Uh, this is one of those races that didn't draw a full field. There's 11 pre-entered and a 12 uh, is preference preferences the juvenile Phillies turf, so good chance we'll get a field of ten in there. Uh, and John, you were talking about that before we went on air about how usually it's completely full fields in the Breeders' Cup. Last year, you were in the only one that wasn't in the juvenile Phillies. We got a couple more this year. Yeah, you certainly have a couple more, and 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 maybe it's my recollection of having a horse in the race that is uh, clouding my memory. But I seem to remember last year, even though it wasn't a full field, there were some really stout horses in there. Bellafina was in there, Kafefi was in there, Serengeti Empress. Um, we were in there. I mean, it, you know, there were that was a really a stout group, even though it wasn't a full field. Mm -hmm. um, and not to take anything away from the Phillies in this race, but it doesn't seem like it has that depth of field like it did last year. Um, you know, maybe other than the ones you guys talked about, maybe you can make a case for Wicked Whisper because she's coming in off of two impressive races and really didn't have to put a lot of energy into winning the Frisette. Um, but it's a big difference, again, just from experience, knowing it's a big difference going from a one-turn mile at Belmont to having the ship across country. Right. and go to Santa Anita. Um, so, you know, she, she's going to have to have her running shoes on uh, in that race. But needless to say, not to take anything away from this group because, you know, usually for juvenile races, there aren't, it's not a full developed group. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think this is as tough of a, of a group as, as last year. I think that's an interesting point about, I think that's part of the reason that I got Jaywalk at 5-1 to one last year. No question. Because of that Frisette to, I mean, it's not cross country, but still stretching out two turns and shipping. 
Yeah, just going for a a real macro thing real quick is that last year we had 221 pre-entries in the Breeders' Cup. That was was a record, and this year there's 188, so that's a pretty significant drop-off. Last year there were 51 foreign Raiders. This year there's only 47, but obviously as a percentage of the total pre-entries, that's that's a pretty – significant bump right and and just to jump in for the for the statistics you know you're looking at 2019 this year 188 pre-entries last year 221 so a 16 percent drop off um the year before that when it was in delamore in 2017 there was 187 so you'd say okay well it's pretty comparable to this year one less race that year there was only there were only 13 breeders cup there's 14 this year so you're missing an entire field on top of that so you know you wonder was it an anomaly last year because it was over 220 horses pre-entered um because it was in kentucky and it was kind of centralized um or is it you know people are are concerned about the specter of of the racetrack and the safety of it and if you have a horse at this level are you worried about it's uh you know it being able to finish the race Mm -hmm. Uh, but John, uh, you know, to play off that, because it's a very interesting um, take on there, and and you you wondered if th- this was going to be a factor. But can you name one good horse that's not running in the Breeders' Cup? I mean, you know, that's the thing. It's not like we're sitting here saying, "Oh my goodness, Code of Honor's not going." He was on the fence for a little bit, uh, or you know, I mean, whomever. Uh, I mean, I think that you know, I don't have the answer why the entries are down, but I can't think of one horse. That is, uh, I mean, maximum security perhaps is going to run the right. same day oddly. Uh, no, I'm sorry, he's running this weekend right. in New York. But, you know, you could see the reason he's not there is because, you know, is he wasn't ready for it with all the stops and starts to his uh, year. So, um, you know, uh, you know, the Breeders' Cup, I, I think, has accomplished what it sets out to do every year is to bring together, you know, all the good, healthy horses, sprinkle in some Europeans and, you know, let, let them settle it out on the racetrack. Right, right. No question about it. And, and, and you're right. You're not missing any headliners. Um, maybe it's people who have younger horses. Um, that aren't willing to, to make that cross-country track and also, you know, if they are a little bit concerned about their safety because now for three-year-olds, there are so many phenomenal races, so many great at stake races, so much money to be made um, that maybe they're saying, you know what, I'm going to skip this one and keep my horse in Florida or New York mm-hmm. um, and then run in a couple of the great at stake races because I, I know Churchill Downs has um, two grade twos for, for babies, you know, for babies um, like Thanksgiving to the end of the year. Florida has, and so does New York. I can't think of one horse, though, that uh, I take that back. Tis a law. I was going to say, weren't you ripping Barkley Tag last week? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, how soon we forget. You know, out of sight, out of mind. But uh, right. there is at least one horse. Now, I think if the Breeders' Cup were in uh, New York or the East Coast, they probably would be running. I don't want to keep going back to the same topic, but uh, I still don't get it. You know, if you have the best horse in the country, um, which he well may be, um, he should be in the Breeders' Cup. And I, and I just don't understand the decision. And there's the Florida-based horse. Um, Safi Joseph's called Chance it, mm-hmm. who uh, swept the Florida Stallion or didn't sweep, but um, but certainly ran well in all three legs, and you know could have made the trip. Um, he's going to the Kentucky Jockey Club. It's um, late November race at Churchill. One other name that isn't there is a Nabel, but I don't think that's because of the, the track. <laughs> I think that was predetermined right. um, after she lost the arc. Uh, juvenile Phillies turf, I don't think is really worth worth discussing at length. The only thing I noticed is there's heavy, heavy Euro participation in there. There's nine European horses pre enter and then a couple others who have previously shipped to the America for a start or two. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. But th- to me, the, the marquee race of the day on Friday is the juvenile. And that's just, I think it's, it's a little bit top heavy, but I think you have three really exciting prospects going forward. Third one is Maxfield. I'm a little partial to, but I think I think he's exciting. But I, I would say the big the big two that everyone's looking at are Dennis's moment and Eight Rings. I mean, they just have been peerless so far. I know Eight Rings dumped the jockey and he technically lost that race, but I think he was. I mean, he was one to five in there. He he probably was going to beat Nucky. I would say um, if he had kept the jockey on. So I think that's the the really exciting thing to watch. Is it's an early. I, I'm not going to say derby preview because there's a million steps in between the juvenile and the derby, but would you be shocked if eight rings and Dennis's moment, if they make it to the starting gate at Churchill or the top two favorites there too? I mean, I wouldn't. No, not at all. And, and, you know, a lot of times, I mean, obviously the juvenile doesn't have a great record of producing Kentucky Derby winners, but a lot of times, you know, after the race is over, you know, I mean, this horse is not going to be a, a contender or a factor in the Kentucky Derby. And, you know, as long as one of the, I, I think you're right, the big three, I'm, I'm, I'm not as high on Maxfield as you are. Um, I just think the Breeders' uh, Futurity at Keeneland is a road to nowhere. A horse is coming out of that never seen to run well in the Breeders' Cup. But, you know, I, I got to respect the horse with his uh, form and ability as well. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think if, uh, especially if somebody drops 
draws off to win this decisively. Mm-hmm. You know, it's going to be, you're going to look at it as a very exciting horse for, uh, if it's one of the three, Dennis's Mom and Eight Rings or Maxfield, a uh, very exciting horse and, and, and really think that this is without a doubt the horse to beat in the Kentucky Derby. As you said, a million things can go wrong. We don't even know if these guys will make it to the Kentucky Derby. But um, yeah, and I also agree, this is, this is far and away the most exciting race of the day. You know, the, the all those turf races earlier are great betting races, but nobody's even going to remember who the winner was, you know, two days later. Of course. Um, this is the race. It's going to resonate with everybody on Friday at Santa Anita. Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't surprise me either if, if Scabbard jumped up and, and, and ran well, the, the horse uh, formerly known as Noose. Mm-hmm. Shout um, out to Teresa Gennaro. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, to be able to go six furlongs, six and a half furlongs, and a mile and 16th and steady and still almost beat, the, the horse that we're talking about that, that's probably going to be the odds on favorite Dennis this moment. Um, it, but uh, it, it's a great heavyweight championship race. And, uh, you know, any of those three or four can, can come in and we would all say, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and uh, be interesting to, to see how they develop after that, because they all look like they're going to be able to bread to go two turns. Mm-hmm. Of course, I'm going to come after you, Bill. Saying that. <laughs> the British Futurity doesn't produce a, a juvenile winner. Street Sense was... Uh, was third in the British Futurity before he went. Right, let me there. let me. The winners of this race never seem to do anything in the Breeders' Cup. If you, insist, okay. if you insist, I mean, I, I'm uh, I'm a fan too of Maxfield. Um, Joe and I were on the same horse um, at Keeneland that weekend. I, I think um, I think Scabbard is in a way the X factor. We can save the heavy handicapping for next week, but um, I'm interested to see what people do with that figure, considering the way that Dennis's moment finished that race. Um, what he was asked or what he wasn't asked to do in the final 16th of a mile. I, I just think it makes Scabbard's race look a little better than than maybe it really was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we, we talked about that the week after the race, that it was probably a little illusory because Dennis's moment was so wrapped up. But yeah, he reeks of a wise guy horse to me, Scabbard, that I think a lot of people are going to try to outsmart the favorites and, and go with him. I'm not hearing any love for um, eight rings here. Um, we barely even mentioned the horse that uh, – um, you know, uh, would be undefeated if not throwing the jockey. Like you said, a six-length winner of a grade one last time out, Bob Baffert. Um, does anybody have any negative opinions on him? I mean, the figure for the American Pharaoh was a little late, I think. Um, other than that, he really hasn't done anything wrong. So, yeah, he's definitely going to be I, – I would I would think it's going to be probably six to five, eight to five, two, two favorites taking the bulk of the money, and then maybe seven to two or four to one on Maxfield, something like that. But, yeah, I mean, they're, de- they're definitely going to be on a, on a similar plane – in terms of the betting public's preference. So I, I'm no um, Mike Welsh or Bruno DiGiulio, but the, the work that he had the other day was, to my to my eye, was not appealing. Mm-hmm. Um, this is eight so rings we're talking eight about. Eight rings, yeah. Um, just didn't finish up, um, just really wasn't hitting the line real hard. And who knows what the instructions were. For all I know, those were the instructions. Um, to me, it was, it was not something that I would want to see. That's the kind of thing that I think will show up in the pools early on too. If he opens up at three to one or something, I think it's probably a good bet that other people have noticed that as well. Um, but no, it's, that's, that's good insight. I hadn't seen that work. So we're joined now by our first, this is our uh, landmark thing on the TDN podcast. It's our first calling guest for the TDN writer's room. And it is the inimitable Saul Kuman of Medicate Stables, head of Plains Partners and several other powerful partnerships. Saul, how's it going? Oh, good, good. good. Thanks for having me on. Good Absol- to talk to you guys. Absolutely. Uh, good to have you. So I guess the main thing we want to ask you about is Midnight Bizu. You're kind of in an interesting spot because you were such a big part of Monomoy Girl last year where she kind of had the better of Midnight Bizu. And then this year, unfortunately, we haven't been able to see Monomoy Girl. It's a pretty good backup plan to have Midnight Bizu on, on, the, on the B team. What has she done this year? I, 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 the question is basically what's she done this year to kind of reach that level that Monomoy Girl was at last year? Oh God. I mean, she's been, she's just been terrific all year. Um, you know, I mean, as Musin, you know, held on to her in the, you know, kind of the, the downtime after the Breeders' Cup and, and gave her a little bit of a break in his barn. And, um, you know, she continues to just kind of continue to get better and better. Um, you know, she showed to be, I would say more versatile, um, than I had originally thought. Mm-hmm. And she's just really improved, um, in Steve's care and, uh, him and his staff have just done an unbelievable job with her. I mean, I think, you know, the year's been, you know, these are just, she's really done nothing wrong so far. And, uh, you know, you're kind of always nervous about going into a, a Breeders' Cup as a favorite, but 
Um, you know, I think it is no one, at least in that race, you can switch places with. Obviously, I think it happened, but uh, it's been a really, really exciting, exciting Philly to be a part of this year. Yeah, and she's she's going to be a big favorite. Um, you know, obviously, you don't want to count your chickens, but if she does win the Breeders' Cup Distaff, do you think that she should be the horse of the year? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't vote. I'm glad I don't vote. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know, uh, you know, I know, I know my place in the uh, in the industry. And uh, and it's not to have uh, I don't have enough knowledge to be to be making those decisions. Um, I think look clearly if, if she wins this race and is eight for eight, um, you know she's got to be in the discussion. I would think the only other horse at that point that would deserve to be in the discussion would be uh, Bricks and Mortar. If people have different views about dirt horses and turf horses. People have different views uh, about you know male and female horses, and I think that will all come into play if they both um, are able to win their Breeders' Cup races. Um, you know, if they both win, I think they're both in discussion. I think if one of them wins and the other doesn't, um, I would think the the winner would be the clear horse of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and I'll you know, have to see what happens, uh, you know, from there. Right. Uh, Sal, it's Bill Finley. Um, you don't have to convince me because I'm a big Midnight Bisu fan. I vote for number one in the NTRA poll each week. But uh, there's some skeptics in the room here. Um, oh, and uh, put that on us. Okay. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that's been brought up is that the history of Phillies winning the um, Horse of the Year, not always, but more often than not, they've run against males. And we had that yep. golden uh, three-race, uh, three-year run where Javier de Grassignan and Rachel Alexander were all uh, – Horse of the year, they all raced against males during that campaign. Um, did you guys ever come close to to uh, thinking about taking on males? And if somebody were to bring that up and say that's a reason why I'm not voting for Midnight Bizu, what would be your retort to that? Yeah, it's a good question, Bill. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't have unfortunately enough history in the game. Um, I've only this is my fifth year uh, doing this, so I you know I, I wasn't able to, unfortunately. To, to watch any of those uh, Phillies that you're talking about run uh, at all. So my, my back knowledge is pretty weak. Um, you know, I, I understand it. It's a fair point. Um, I don't think if you're a female, you're, you know, to, to be horse of the year, you're expected to beat the boys. I mean, I, I, I don't, um, I just, it, to me, you're in a division and if you win all your races in the division and people think you're worthy of it, then you, you know, you deserve to get some votes. I understand that as a, you know, potential criticism. Um, you know, if bricks and mortar goes and wins the, you know, the big person, in the mile and a half race, and that's a reason that, that people decide they're going to vote for him over her. I, I, I get it. I understand it. You know, for us, kind of the second part of your question, I don't think we ever seriously considered it. Um, you know, J- Jeff Bloom, um, who's the majority owner of the, the Philly, um, along with Steve Asmussen, were really making the, you know, the decisions and campaigning her. Um, and, um, you know, it never at least got to the point where, we had a real discussion about it with, with, uh, you know, with me involved. And, um, so my guess is they talk about lots of stuff, um, but it never quite, um, got far enough along what they were, you know, they were, they were ready to do it. I don't think. So it's Jonathan Green. It's a pleasure to uh, talk to you. I know we, we met briefly last year at the Eclipse Awards, um, but we were both uh, meeting so many people. I, I don't think we had a meaningful conversation. So thanks for coming on the show today. We appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks again for having me. You know, you've had such great success in such a short period of time. You mentioned only only four or five years in the business. But one aspect that I think goes unnoticed um, is the fact that you do donate a percentage of the Breeders' Cup earnings to um, to new vocations and to other nonprofits. Let's uh, we want to promote that a little bit because that part of the industry doesn't get uh, you know recognized as often as it should. But as a leading owner in the industry, what prompted you to do that, and and what are your expectations? Well, I mean, Anna Ford at New Vacations does an absolutely terrific job. And, um, you know, we've, we've done it since our first year with Lady Eli and the Breeders' Cup. And, um, you know, we'll do it this year and, and, you know, always continue to do it. It's a very easy way to support, um, you know, an unbelievable organization. And aftercare is such a huge part of the sport. Uh, you know, Anna does as good of a job as anybody. So that's one of those kind of, honestly, one of those easy sort of no-brainer decisions. Um, if you're lucky enough to get a big portion of any, you know, purse that day, it's plenty of dollars for you and your partners. It's a pretty easy thing to, uh, you know, to give back to the people that need it uh, and the horses that need it. So um, I kind of chalked that one up to one of the easier decisions that you make throughout the year. Hey, Saul, it's uh, Alan Carrasso. Um, you know, looking at her PPs, she's run everywhere except Kalamazoo Downs, it looks like, Bill, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. She's obviously not, uh, not a filly that needs to take her racetrack with her. She's also got the familiarity with with Santa Anita, not necessarily a track, but 
but having stabled there with Bill Sparr uh, in the early part of her career. Uh, her work the other day, I spoke with Jeff the other day and uh, just wanted to see what you thought of her work the other day. Listen, it, it was great. I mean, they've been they've been super happy with how she's been coming into the race. Um, you know, I I, uh, I, I I couldn't be happier about kind of where we are. Um, you know, at this point, you, you know, you hope, you know, the next 10 days or so goes well and um, you hope you get a post that's decent and um, and you have, you know, you hope you get a good trip. But I think coming into the race, um, you know, we feel we feel really, really good about where she is. Uh, Saul, Bill Finley again. Um, maybe we can break some news on the podcast here. Um, that we had mentioned earlier that, that what a great uh, 2018 Monomoy girl has had. Um, and uh, late summer, there was still hope that she would make the Breeders' Cup. Obviously, that didn't come to fruition. Uh, looks like this whole year is going to be a loss for you guys. Where do things stand? Is she going to be retired or is she going to uh, come back and race next year? Uh, she's going to come back and race next year. Terrific. I mean, it's, it's, been a, it's been a really tough year with her. Um, you know, we... We gave her, she, you know, she, after the Breeders' Cup, you know, we normally give, you know, the good horses that, you know, had long campaigns some time off. She had really, you know, some, some bone bruising and some basic stuff, but nothing major. Um, we gave her the time that we, you know, any good, you know, any horse deserves and brought her back. And, uh, and, you know, we were you know, pretty close to picking a race. Um, you know, I think there was, we were sort of one or two weeks away and we sort of felt like we got one prep in her. Um, you know, we might have a chance at the Breeders' Cup. She was breezing. And I think she had her last two works, um, you know, before the one where she was just a little bit off were uh, tremendous. So, um, you know, we had to send her kind of back to the farm. She's uh, she's been at Windstar. Um, she's you know, she's doing really well right now. She looks good, um, but it's going to take a little bit of time. So we'll be patient. Um, you know, we got together as an ownership group and sort of thought, do we sell her? Do we bring her back? I think the great news about our group is that everybody really loves racing. And um, and that's why we do it. So it was kind of an easy decision, frankly. Everybody wanted to bring her back, and uh, and that's the plan. So, um, you yeah, know, we're excited for next year. Um, you know, I think that um, you know, there's nothing that's been wrong with her, frankly, either time that we've given her time off has been uh, any kind of an injury that would scare you um, as far as you know her her probability to come back or her ability to race at a high level. They've both been kind of small things, but as you guys know, you've been doing this longer than me. It's you know. 60 days is six months, right? It's never uh, the time to actually get back. They tell the new owner, oh, it's just going to be 30 days. And then you realize, okay, 30 days is five months. Uh, so it's it, uh, everything takes a little longer than anticipated. You know, with her, obviously, we're going to be super careful. We really want her to be back for the meat of next year's season. So we're not going to rush her back and take our time. And then, uh, you know, hopefully we'll see her run, um, you know, either at Oaklawn or, or Belmont or something like that uh, in the uh, in the spring. Uh, so I, this is Joe Bianca again, and I just wanted to kind of run down who else you're involved with for the Breeders' Cup because, you know, you do get involved with a lot of different partnerships. I know you're in, on eight rings. Who's got a yeah. big, big chance in the juvenile. What else are you looking forward to uh, at the yeah, Breeders' so, Cup? So I thought you guys would be proud of me. I've got two yearling purchases, both, uh, you know, both in the in the Breeders' Cup juvenile with uh, with eight rings and uh, British Idiom. All right, that's both ground bought, floor. That's uh, the ground both, floor. Both bought as, uh, as babies. Everyone gives me a hard time for buying the private horses. So <laughs> I thought I'd get a little bit of love for that from the boys. <laughs> well, um, we never give you a hard time, so. No, nah, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So, uh, yeah, so so we've got eight rings in the in the juvenile race. So I think um, I think he's got a big shot um, doing really well with Bob. A little bit of a little bit of a head case as we saw a few races back, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, I think he's, he's coming into the race doing very well. Um, British idiom is a, a horse that we bought as a baby who, you know, is two for two Philly doing really well with Brad Cox. Uh, we're excited about her. Uh, I own a part of a horse with Eric Johnson called comical, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, will also be in that same race against British idiom. Um, we've got a horse called Andesite that we bought as a two year old in training, uh, that Brad Cox has the race second in a pilgrim, um, that will be in the juvenile turf. Uh, we have one called Miss J. McKay for the turf sprint that is sitting on the outside looking in. I think one or two out right now. Mm -hmm. So we need a couple things to go our way for that that to happen. That's a, a filly with Cal Lynch. Um, we've got Uni and Bowie's Hero, both in the mile race. Um, you know, Uni's a horse we bought from Europe and has had a good campaign with Chad Brown, ran really well um, in the first lady. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hoping we don't get a bounce effort there, but, but uh, the... You know, she's coming into the race great. Her last breeze was actually really tremendous. Um, and then Bowie's Hero uh, as well, uh, winning the Shadwell Mile. So both those horses are are coming off pretty good efforts and I think have shots. Uh, Yoshida in the Classic. 
Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe a shot. We'll see. It's a kind of a weird race, um, but he's doing pretty well. Uh, Midnight Bisu we talked about. Um, the sprint, uh, a horse called Landeskog with Doug O'Neill, a horse called Whitmore, who we're not 100% sure which race he's going to run in yet or even if he's going to come. Um, we're kind of looking at the fields and trying to make a decision. Uh, Cole front, um, and that, will, that, uh, will be in the mile. And I think, you know, he's doing pretty well. I like his last race. Um, obviously, you know, the favorite will be tough in there, but I think, I think, um, you know, he'll be, he'll put on a good show or good effort. So we got some good stuff. I mean, this is look this, you know, you, you kind of look at your year every year at the beginning of the year, if you had said to me, you know, where, what horses are you most excited about? Honestly, I would have told you bottom boy girl one. Um, who obviously we talked about her year, Catholic boy, I probably would have said too. You know, we didn't talk about him, but he just, you know, wasn't able to really move forward and had a bunch of little naggy stuff this year. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, you know, we, we just re- retired him to stud. And then World of Trouble, who was, a, you know, ran second as a three-year-old and, and was undefeated this year and obviously won a grade one on turf and dirt. So, you know, you kind of lose the three horses that were really at the top of your stable, or at least that you were maybe personally, I was personally most excited about. Right. Um, but, you know, the last couple of weeks, we had some things pop up that weren't anticipated, right? So we just, you know, keep trying to stick with a process and um, and with a plan. And, you know, sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you get unlucky. And, um, you know, we need we need about you know, the next 10 days, we need some luck in our favor and try to try to close this year out the right way. You're going to bring a whole suitcase full of hats? I mean, that's like 20 different hats you got to wear for the weekend. <laughs> I, I do get a lot of hats. I take one of each for myself. Uh, I put it in the Saratoga house and the rest of them I, uh, I just give away. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much for the time. Oh, anytime. Good. Anytime, guys. Thanks so much. Good luck, Look man. Have, seeing ha- some of you guys uh, out in California. Yeah, have a blast out there. We'll, we'll see All you, man. Good luck. Thanks. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. See ya. So that was Saul Kuman, uh, who has a horse in pretty much every race in, in the Breeders' Cup, and we want to thank him for coming on and being our first calling guest here at the Writers' Room. Saul's always good to talk to, and uh, we wish him luck going forward in the Breeders' Cup and, and through the rest of the year. Good to hear Modern White Girls coming back, definitely. I think that we assume that because they're they're kind of a really racing forward partnership, but it's good to get that confirmation, and hopefully she can come back as the same horse because you never know with these fillies, especially, like what, the, what they're going to become. That's why I think it was kind of impressive what Midnight Bisou has done this year. But anyway, uh, we're going to move on to sun- Saturday's races now. Um, not going to touch on every single race uh, in the interest of keeping this under – uh, a week long podcast. <laughs> um, we, so we got we got the Philly and Merit Sprint to kick things off. I think the whole story there is Kafefe. I mean, she's she's probably the most exciting Philly um, sprinter. I don't know, and in, in a long time, I can't remember. I mean, Unique Bella was was nice, but she was kind of a middle distance horse. I felt like more so than a pure sprinter, even though she won the championship. So Kafefe is kind of. She's taken her her track with her a little bit. I mean, she ran the big race in the Miss Preakness. She ran the big race in the Dogwood. She ran well in the test, although maybe not quite as well um, as in the other races. But first time out in California, so that's 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 going to be a challenge. But I think especially with the seven furlongs, I think she's better at seven than six. I don't really think it's down to her and come dancing in that race. I don't know if anybody else sees something else. Uh, I certainly I don't, don't know. Yeah. Um, and, and you know what? I'm not even going to say it's a two-horse race. I think it's a one-horse race. Okay. I, I, I like her that much. And if you didn't like her before um, last weekend, the fact that she beat Bells and won by eight lengths, and Bells and won came back and won the Raven run uh, and, and paid, what, $28 or something like that. I mean, now that race, uh, the dog would just, just flies off the page. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, strange things happen in the Breeders' Cup, but, you know, you look at her 107 buyer in that race and come dancing is 98, 96, 97 in her last few starts. She does have a 114 to go back to, but she doesn't seem to be that kind of horse right now. Um, you know, Kofefi runs back to that race. I don't think she loses. And, uh, you know, I have tons of confidence in Brad Cox's ability to get her uh, to race again on a high level. So um, I don't know if this is part of the pick six or anything like that. Um, probably not. But, um, you know, I, I think if anybody is doing horizontal wagers, uh, you know, you look at this horse as a potential single. And if she uh, she gets beat, you just uh, move on and try to hit the next thing coming up. Um, but I... I, I uh, Come dance, he's got a very nice record, but this is all about Kofefi. Mm-hmm. Well, just for kicks and giggles, then I'll take the field. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll bet a case of Rolling Rock. Well, you know, Rock. that's not a bad bet because no. if she's under even money, that's a good bet. It's for a good me. bet. It really yeah. is. Um, and I think she will be. Don't you think she'd be four to five? 
No question. Yeah. yeah no okay. Question. All right. So yeah. you're on. Yeah. So we're all in. Okay. okay. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll do okay. the proverbial uh, handshake uh, okay. agreement that we have, you know, witnesses on. Um, and, and really, it's just a matter of there's so many good horses in, in any given race at this level um, that if they're just a little off, then, then they, uh, they may not hit the numbers. Um, it, again, if you look at patterns, you know, the horse went, ran an 86, then bounced a little bit. They gave it time off, ran an 84. I'm talking about Confefi, ran an 84, peaked at a 107 bounce the next time out to an 84 started the, the trend again to a 98 107 you know if you're if you're looking at the buyer numbers and looking at patterns you would say okay she's maybe going to a bounce um I, you know bill i would agree with you that she's definitely the horse to beat in the race um but i'll take you know a group of 10 or 11 against her just to see what happens um but it, it really is out of all the races that we've talked about so far she's the standout in her race i think the draw is going to be pretty important if she draws inside i'd be more likely to, to bet against her I think the turf sprint is kind of a snooze i think the only only real storyline is to see if stormy liberal can get back to his good form because he really just hasn't been the same horse since you know he ran third in the alcohol sprint that was a really good effort but since coming back he's third in the green flash at del mar fifth in the turf sprint at, at kentucky downs and then third in the eddie d at santa anita i mean these are races that he's supposed to win easily if, if he's who he was a year ago or earlier this spring so i don't know anybody have any feelings about that race interesting that um that stormy's half brother Mindster is in the race as well. Mm. It's kind of cool. That is pretty cool. Absolutely. He, he's on the way up, I think. And Stormy Liberal's on the way down. Uh, yeah, that race, when he won the Troy, I mean, he was like 5-1 to one or something. He could have been 50-1, to one and I wouldn't have played him. But, I mean, it was, it was a big number. Uh, the Dirt Mile, the big-ass fans Dirt Mile. It's, <laughs> by, by the way, best name for a horse race ever. Yeah. In the history of the <laughs> sport, best name for a yeah, horse race Yeah, you need ever. to lock in like a Better than... Better than the, the, the Jeff Ruby stakes. Come on. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really that's good, a good one, one too. But right. it, come on, you can't you cannot top big ass fans. Unless, they need to lock know. in like a twenty year sponsorship. Yeah, for give that, it to the guy race. for free just because it's so cool. I, yes. I mean, it's just uh, I mean, this is the race of this race of the century. If you ask me, just because you know I've been so looking forward to the big ass fans Breeders Cup Dirt Mile. But that's another race like the Philly and Mare Sprint that I think it's pretty much a one horse race. I mean, Omaha Beach. You know, I think the initial reaction was that it was a little bit lame that he went to the dirt mile because it's the easiest road to take of the three races he was considering. But I mean, you're looking at the field, you certainly can't blame them. I mean, it looks it looks like an easy ticket to another million dollar purse for him. So I, I, I can't blame him for that. Uh, anybody else have any other ideas in that race? It's kind of hard to come up with. Uh, I just want to get Alan's opinion on the Korean shipper. Um, I mean, this horse has just uh, won two um, major races there, an $800,000 race at the Korean Sprint. Uh, American bred by Tisnow of a Dixie Union mayor. Um, does this horse have any shout out? Uh, look, he's going to go in the gate. Yeah, he's going to have some chest that way. <laughs> he's um, a horse. He has four legs. So they've gotten Flavian Pratt to ride. Flavian rode the uh, battle midway in the dirt mile two years ago. So that um, certainly is an endorsement. Um, he's rumored to be the best horse that Korea's ever generated, which probably going to sniff it at and, um, and probably rightfully so. But there's a horse in Korea called Dol Kong who won illicit stakes in Dubai last year, was group one placed as well. And they think Blue Chipper is better than, than he is now. I'm not here to tell you that he's going to win this race. Uh, they thought this was a more suitable spot than the sprint. They thought that the six furlongs was too short, even though he just won the, the Keeneland Korea sprint. Um, I think he's going to go out there and give an honest account of himself. He's He seems to me, I think a runner is a runner. And, um, you know, those tracks over there are deep. It's a, for him to run 136, um, on the track in, in the very south of Korea. And those tracks are, are deep. Those are those are beachy. Mm. And um, for him to run 136, he broke the track record by a full second. Um, he can run. I'm not going to tell you he's going to win, but I think he's going to run. Do they sell big-ass fans in Korea? Couldn't tell you. They will if the horse yeah. wins, that's for yeah. sure. Next race on the docket is the, is the Philly Ameriturf, another race with pretty big European involvement. Weirdly, Magical's first listed first preference is the turf but she's supposed to run in the philly and mare turf and again like and the more that i look at this the more i think saturday looks like a pretty chalky day i can't see anybody beating her, her. thing i love about magical and, and aiden o'brien in general is 
you look at her PPs and you would swear that she was a male. You would swear that she was a cult because she never runs against her own sex. One time in her last 10 starts in the Yorkshire Oaks did she run against the girls. Every other start, the Arc, the the champion stakes, the Irish champion stakes, the Coral Eclipse, like these are all against the best males in Europe. And and she shows up pretty much every time. She had a little bit of a dull effort in the arc. But other than that, first, second, first, first, first. And she really gave Enable all she could handle in the Breeders' Cup last year. I know Enable was the story, but I came away extremely impressed with Magical and her gameness just to hang in there. And she was I don't know, 13 lengths clear a second, like, or clear a third. And Enable's not at the race. She's a double-digit winner of the Breeders' Cup turf, and we're starting to talk about her credentials as, as an all-time great. So I can't really look past her in this race. I don't know how you guys feel. I mean, obviously, it's Sister Charlie as well, but I just think I think the class of Magical is too much for, for Sister Charlie. Um, I'll jump in. Um, I mean, not to knock Magical at all. Um, everything you said is true, but I, I can't back up your statement that this is a one-horse race when Sister Charlie's in there. Um, you know, let's not forget that she won this race last year. Uh, she's three for three this year. And um, Mr. Chad Brown, I've heard he's a pretty good trainer. Um, he's okay. This guy, yeah. Um, and, you know, he's, he's plotted for this race. Uh, you know, Sister Charlie's form against males uh, separates her from Sister Charlie, who's only run against females in her career. But in I don't care if they brought over um, Nijinsky for this race, and, and Nijinsky was a girl. Um, I, I'm not going to say pick any horse and say that uh, Sister Charlie can't beat him uh, on the square. She's and nice, but I mean, I, the last race I didn't love the Flower Bowl. I thought I expected a much more impressive performance out of that. Um, and you know, last year in the Breeders' Cup, if they had run head to head, Sister Charlie and Magical on their with their respective efforts last year, who do you think would have won the race? Um, yeah, I mean, again, a good point, but, you know, you're forgetting one thing. This is Chad Brown, and, you know, it's just that name next to a horse in the program with a good horse, I'm never going to toss that horse out mm -hmm. or say that they can be beaten. Yeah, and he's done a great job with yeah, her. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I've raved about Chad on, on, on many times in the paper and on the podcast before. I mean, that's how much respect I have for him. Um, you know, I guess if, if you think that way, bet the uh, the exacta and hope it comes back and pays $12. It's not going to pay $12, okay. I don't think. Probably 8 or 9 All right. Um, moving on to the sprint, it's... Not the most exciting sprint I've ever seen, but you got a little bit of the star power. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge Matoli fan. Similar to Midnight Bizu, I like that Steve Asmussen sent him out there early to get him accustomed to the track, and it seems like he's taken to it. He drilled a five for a long bullet in 58 and four from the gate the other day. So pretty good, pretty good uh, omen, I, I would think, for this race if he continues to train that way. Imperial Hand is a, obviously a, um, a, a, a crowd favorite, a fan favorite because he's so tiny and so game. We love those horses here. Uh, Catalina Cruiser, um, who's the news came out today that he's going to Lane's End. Not a big surprise being by Union Rags, but he's got an outside shot as well. But I, I, I'm all about Matoli in the, in the sprint. I mean, we'll see with the draw, and we'll see how much speed ends up in there. But again, not, another not full field, um, which is a little bit surprising, and maybe that, that, that works even better for the favorites, that there's less of a chance of a supersonic pace that you sometimes get in the sprint. You know, again, we'll, we'll kind of dissect these races next week. Um, I'm kind of hoping Whitmore ends up shipping out and that they opt for the sprint. Um, his race at Keeneland is better than it looks last time out. Imperial Hint and Chance Lot and Catalina Cruiser, Cruiser to a certain extent. I mean, the, the pace is going to be cracking and it's going to set up for somebody with Whitmore style, assuming the track is not biased. Mm -hmm. About the mile, I don't know. Like, I don't really have any strong opinions, but Al, you could probably speak to some of the Euros. I mean, I think it's outstanding that we have, um, I mean, you get the occasional Philly, the, the American-based Philly in, in this race. I think it's great to see Get Stormy and, uh, or Got Stormy, sorry, and uh, and Uni both show up. I mean, if, if Uni were able to reproduce her effort, if she draws a gate and... Um, is allowed to settle and make a run like she did at Keeneland. I don't think they're going to beat her. That was an unbelievable run. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's she's had some nice races before, but that to me was a clear jump forward. 
weird. Uh, to um, me, as a, as a as a handicapper, this is the most exciting race yeah. of the card. Um, yeah. You know, because you can make a case literally for seven, eight horses in mm-hmm. here, um, and and with the Euros coming over, and and uh, just the excitement of having Euros and Phillies in the race. I mean, it, it's really anybody's game. Yeah, yeah, and, definitely the best betting race on the card. I would yeah. say. And so many times, um, I think you've seen horses that win the Bru- the Bruce Cup Juvenile Turf. Um, they just don't go on. They don't train on very well. And Line of Duty is actually trained on this year okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's third in the Prix de Moulin at, at uh, Longchamp. And um, and Circus Maximus beat him that day. Um, he's coming over as well. So those are two pretty high-quality three-year-old European milers. Um, they could have something to say as well. Mm-hmm. Um, let me um, just bring up a point and see how you guys feel about this. Um, Al, you're on the uni bandwagon, but what if she draws 14? Uh, I mean, what about post positions in this race? Um you know, that, that to me would be, I'd put a big X through anybody that draws, you know, 12, 13, 14, maybe even 11 through 14. I mean, they got to have to be so superior to the field to win from that post. And, you know, the race is too evenly matched. Right. I mean, it has happened before. We talked about this in the last couple of podcasts. Uh, six Perfections and Caracanti have come from out there to win. I think um, given her running style, she's going to drop back, um, get over, save ground, and um, and come with a late run. I'm less worried about. You know, she's not a speedball. She doesn't need to be up there with the pace. So I would be less concerned with her about the about the draw. Yeah, I think those late closers. I generally don't pay as much attention to the draw as I do with horses who have speed. Uh, in the turf, I mean, bricks and mortar is going to be a pretty heavy favorite. I think he might be. A little bit of a bet against. I mean, it's uh, there's it's it's hard just looking at it again. We're looking at this. We've only had this for about an hour or two, so we're just kind of skimming it. We'll have more fleshed out thoughts next week. But I don't know. You got enough decent Europeans in there that at, at a distance that we don't know if bricks and mortar can handle. I think he's probably one of the favorites you want to take a shot against on Saturday. I can see that. Um, and we didn't discuss the uh, distaff. Are we going to just leave Sal Kuman's quotes for that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sal, um, Sal covered that. He's got a, he's, he's got the winner. I, right. I, I'm going to say that. I'm going to go out and say that. All right. I just wanted to uh, let people know we didn't forget about that race because we've been going in chronological order. I mean, what's not to like about bricks and mortar? It's not a very insightful comment there. But, um, you know, I, I see what you're saying that, you know, this race is wide open and you have some uh, unknowns in here. I, I wish Magical was in this one. I really do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't understand why they made this race their first preference um, if that wasn't their intention. Uh, they have this Anthony Van Dyke horse in there, and they being, of course, Coolmore and Aiden O'Brien. But, you know, his form is pretty, uh, doesn't really do much to inspire are you um yeah I, I can see your point but let's not forget you know bricks and mortars probably running for horse of the year here i think if he wins it the fact that he's been on top in the polls all year long uh he will win horse of the year and um again you know i, I just yes i am a member of the chad brown fan club yes i've unabashedly <laughs> like you know have a man crush on this the guy pom-poms yeah. out uh, oh yeah but you know again it's it's chad brown and you know, he uh, he zeroed in on this race probably uh, from the time the horse won the Pegasus, you know, put this in his sights. Um, I hate to see that they don't have a race since August, but, uh, you know, that's modern training for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly um, I don't see any reason why he can't go a mile and a half. I honestly think that, you know, with the distance question mark, I would have liked to see him in the Joe Hirsch, you know, at Belmont just to give it a try before they do this. But like you said, that's modern training. I understand um, the desire to have a full 10 weeks or whatever it is leading up to this, but I I would have liked to see him take a crack at that first. So we're going to finish this off with the classic, obviously. I don't want to be negative, but to me, this is one of the least inspiring British Cup classics I've ever seen. Um, You know, you got a couple of of big names and Code of Honor and LA and McKenzie, but really, like, if anybody else wins that race, it's going to be one of, it's going to be probably the most forgettable renewal since Valpone. <laughs> since who? Take it back to Arlington for Al. <laughs> I was there. I was there. Freezing my behind off. I mean, I think people people more remember the scam, the pick six scam more than they do who actually won the race. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's hard to get excited about that race. I think it's most interesting if Code of Honor wins because then you've got more of a scramble for horse of the year. But other than that, I just, I, I couldn't care less really. I know it's bad to say <laughs> I'm going to be out there covering it, but it's just not exciting to me at all. Compared to the compared to the other races, look your your favorite is two for six this year mm-hmm. um, in um, in the Baffert horse that uh, you know is McKinsey just being favorite by default. Yeah, 
in here. Um, it's highly unlikely Horse of the Year will emerge from this. I think the Code of Honor would have to win in both Bricks and Mortar and, and – um, and Midnight Bizu would have to lose. Um, so I don't think that we're going to see Horse of the Year. Yeah, you know, it's just, uh, I don't say it's a yawner because it is a Breeders' Cup Classic and there's some very good horses in here, but I totally agree. I mean, this is not one of the rare years where this is not the race. You're going to wake up Saturday morning and say, that's what I'm really looking right. forward to today at Santa Anita. Yeah. No, not at all. Mm-hmm. All right, so that's it for this week's episode. Uh, I want to I want to thank everybody for listening to our semi coherent rambling on the Breeders Cup pre entries. Next week, when we have the real entries, I think people will have a little bit more of a, a, a solid opinion about the races. I'm going to be at Santa Anita next week, so Bill Finley will be your guest co host. Uh, I want to thank Bill. I want to thank John Green, Alan Carasso, and our first call in guest, Saul Kuman and his coterie of Breeders' Cup Mm -hmm. contenders. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. 